Uh, the first speaker is uh, Karel Ha, and he will give us an introduction to our PBM So, hi everyone, welcome to the uh, talks on our new game theory. And, uh, let's talk what, about what is different from classical game theory. Uh, the main reason for algorithmic game theory is that uh, you want to try to also find solutions uh, to games, so uh, not just prove the existence. And one classical example is, for example, Google AdWords. When you uh, search type keywords on Google, then uh, you are also over. <laughs> Several links uh, from advertisements, and uh, this is basically algorithmic game theory. We will talk. Uh, we will first uh, show some motivational examples. Then we will uh, formally define the games, and we will talk uh, about what can be the solutions to these games. And uh, then we will, we will briefly discuss uh, how to find the solutions to these games. <laughs> Uh, so, the classical example of the game is the Prisoner's Dilemma, and I'm certain that a lot of people know this, but just to be sure, imagine there are two criminals, Criminal 1 and Criminal 2, and uh, these are the players. Each of them uh, has two options, either to confess to a crime or to remain silent. What you can see here uh, is a uh, so-called cost matrix. Uh, it, it is a bimetrix form. Uh, so I, I will say an example. If, for example, the first prisoner confessed to a crime and the second one keeps silent, well, because the first cooperated, then uh, the police guy would give him just one year in the prison and uh, the second one, who kept silent and did basically nothing, he will stay there for five years. So this is the notation, and these are called the outcomes of uh, every action or strategy. And uh, in this game we can see that um, a stable show solution is for everybody to confess to a crime, because if I am uh, that uh, stupid, basically, I keep silent, uh, it would be better for me to, to confess to a crime, because in every scenario I would uh, gain more. Any questions? Okay. I want to, so, uh, to show an analogy in um, the real world, which is ISP routing game where ISP uh, stands for Internet Service Provider. So imagine there are two Internet Service Providers, uh, the first one and the second one. This is the uh, network of the first one, and this is the network of the second one. Now, uh, the first one wants to send packets from uh, source node 1 to uh, target node 1, and he can choose uh, from two transit points, C or S. If he, every edge has a cost of 1. So if he choose, chooses uh, the transit point C, he would pay only uh, one amount of uh, cost. But in that case, the second ISP uh, has to uh, transfer the packets through three uh, edges. So, in the end, uh, there would be the total cost of 4. And what I want to see, uh, what I want to show about this example is that it is equivalent to uh, the prisoner's dilemma. 
basically the names of the endpoints were chosen to be the same as uh, in the prisoner. So, um, for example, if um, the first ISP gave selfish way, then he would um, just have a cost of one, but the second ISP would have to uh, have much higher cost. And if both of them are selfish, then in the end, both of them would have to pay a uh, cost of four. So if we turn back to the previous uh, slide, we can see that if both of them could send uh, the traffic to endpoint C, then both of them would incur a cost of four. So I think this is a nice analogy uh, in the real world. So we can skip. Uh, another game, which is a pollution game, and uh, it is basically a multiplayer version of Prisoner's Dilemma. So, what are the rules of these games? Uh, there are players which are M countries, and they have two options. They can either pass a legislation law to control pollution, or uh, not to control pollution. If they decide uh, to control pollution, okay, uh, if a country decides to control pollution, it will get a cost of free. But, uh, if, if they decide not to control the pollution, uh, the air will be so terrible that they will add the cost of one to the cost of all, all countries. So, if I, for example, China, then uh, I will add uh, the pollution cost to every other country in the world, uh, including, of course, my country. So, uh, what I want to show in this example is that selfish behavior can lead to uh, socially unacceptable situations. So, imagine that uh, there are K countries that uh, do not control the pollution. So, uh, in this case, each of these countries would have a cost of uh, K. Because they are uh, adding one. Each of the K countries are adding one to the cost of all. And the remaining N minus K countries that are nice guys and uh, controlling uh, pollution, they would have cost also K from, uh, from other countries for us free because of the uh, of controlling fees. So it is obvious that for each country it would be better to uh, not control pollution because K is less than K plus 3 in mathematics. <laughs> so that means that um, if everybody behaves selfishly, then uh, nobody controls pollution, and in that case, uh, everybody would add 1 to the cost of all countries. So every country would uh, have cost of N. Right? But this is really unacceptable because uh, we can have that every country controls pollution. And in that case, every country will have cost of only three. So we can see that selfish behavior can lead to, to, uh, to totally bad situations. Okay, so we can move to the next game. Okay, 
and this is a game called Routing Congestion Game. So imagine there is a uh, network, <coughs> the internet network, and here we have uh, some proxy node or some router, and uh, there are two connection points, A and B. A is closer to O, so it would have a lower cost, while B is slightly uh, farther away. But the point is, uh, there are uh, two players. Uh, one stream of packet called traffic 1, and second stream of packets called traffic 2. And uh, the network is so fragile that if uh, both players decide to go through the same edge, uh, then uh, the the edge would basically get stuck, so it would slow down the computer. So we can, uh, for example, if both players decide to uh, go through a uh, connection point, then each of them would get the cost of five. But if they coordinate and uh, the first player would go through a, he would get uh, just the cost of one and uh, the other player, uh, traffic 2, uh, who would go through the other edge, would get the cost of 2, which is slightly uh, larger, but it is much better because they go through different routes. Okay, so uh, now we will uh, define what are the games, what are the simultaneous move games, and uh, the best would be to show what they consist of. So there are uh, there is set uh, n of players, which in prisoners uh, the amount was player one, player two. Then uh, each player has some pure strategy, which is just a fancy word for action. So in prisoners the amount it was to confess or to remain silent. And uh, each player chooses from his possible options for his possible pure strategies and uh, then there is the outcome of all the combinations of chosen strategies uh, which, uh, which is the vector of selected strategies and uh, the important thing is that uh, each player has some preference on which outcome is better for him or worse. So, for example, in the uh, congestion uh, game, uh, he, every player would prefer to go through different nodes than go through the same. But uh, usually, we uh, we did, uh, have outcomes represented by some function to real numbers. So it's either your, it depends on your point of view. It's, you either have a payoff, which is money you get, or you can have a cost function, uh, which is money you would lose. But we can see that they are equivalent because uh, we can just switch the uh, sign of uh, the number. So uh, the games can be, it is important in the upward thinking theory. Uh, also, how we represent games because we want to do some calculations with them. So, uh, usually, what uh, was shown in the prisoner's dilemma or uh, congestion games uh, was the standard form or matrix form. That means that uh, uh, every possible uh, combination of strategies is listed and uh, for every combination we have uh, the respective payoffs. So, uh, for example, in the prisoner that was the 4-4 for four, four each player. But we can also have uh, some compact way to represent games or something, if you want a new fancy word. And, uh, for example, uh, in the potion game, it was uh, the formula for calculating. Uh, we didn't have to uh, enumerate every possible combination. So uh, now we get to the solution concepts. Um, the first solution concept 
uh, is a dominant strategy. It was mentioned in the prison of Derma when I said a uh, stable solution. And uh, okay, it is a strategy vector uh, S such that uh, for each player uh, and each alternate strategy vector S prime, the, the following inequality holds. And uh, translated to uh, human language, uh, it means that. Uh, when, when there is a strategy vector, then it is optimal for players to play it, no matter what the others play. So, whatever the others choose, for me it is always the best to play as high. So, for example, in the Prism Delma, it is uh, the situation when both players uh, confess. Because, as I said, when somebody keeps silent, he can switch to confess confessing and in every scenario it would improve his uh, cost. So, um, but uh, uh, not every time it is possible to find such good solution, the main strategy. So, we can uh, introduce a slightly weaker condition a pure Nash equilibrium, which is uh, basically this, this same strategy vector uh, that you can see in this definition, uh, but uh, the difference is that uh, it, it, it is the uh, best action for you, assuming that other players will stick to this proposed strategy. So, uh, for example, in the congestion game, it would be uh, to, uh, for players to choose, uh, for the f second traffic player to choose um, the A route and for the second the B route because uh, if any of the players would uh, deviate from the proposed strategy then the network would get stuck and they would use this, the same node. So, that is and clearly, every dominant strategy is a pure Nash equilibrium. It is easy to see because uh, if you have dom a dominant strategy, it is optimal for you no matter what others do. In Nash equilibrium, it is optimal for you assuming that others will stick to the proposed strategy. So, uh, there is another game. Uh, this, this game is called Matching Planes. Uh, <coughs> why I introduced this game was because uh, not every time you have pure Nash equilibrium. In this game, uh, okay, I, I wish. Uh, in this game, there are two players, first and second. And every player has uh, a coin. He can either show heads or tails. And the first player also heads or tails. The first player is a matcher. He wants the uh, pennies to match. So if two heads occur, then he would win and get one point. Or if two tails occur, then he would also get one point. But if the pennies mismatch heads and tails, he would lose a point or tails and heads. On the other hand, the second player is mismatcher. So he wants the pennies to mismatch. So if heads and tails, of course, or tails and heads, he would win, and if heads and heads, or tails and tails, he would lose. So, uh, for, oh, can I uh, for this game, uh, we can see there is no pure Nash equilibrium, because if there was a pure Nash equilibrium, for example, this one, then definitely one player would lose. So, by definition, he would prefer to switch to the other, to the other uh, side of the coin, and then he would uh, get a much higher outcome because he would win. So, it can it is easy to see that in this game there is no pure Nash equilibrium. So, we need to uh, introduce a mixed strategy. We need to introduce some probability into choosing actions. So, a, a mixed strategy is basically some probabilistic distribution over what you can uh, choose to add. 
And uh, in, in that case, each player wants to maximize the expected payoff under this uh, distribution. So we have some uh, risk neutral players. We only care about the expected payoff. So, uh, for example, in matching pennies, I can decide uh, that each player will have 50 50 probability. You can basically take the coin and flip it. So the chance would take care of the probabilistic distribution. Okay. And with that notion, we can introduce the mixed Nash equilibrium, which is basically just the generalization of pure Nash equilibrium. We only have that uh, the expected uh, payoff of uh, uh, players would uh, be the optimum. So that means that if you have some uh, probability distribution, and if assuming that all the other players uh, would uh, stick to it, then uh, you would prefer not to deviate, or you wouldn't gain anything from deviating of the proposed uh, strategy vectors. So, um, the most famous theorem in game theory, uh, coming from Nash, states that uh, in any game, if you have uh, not too many players, finite set of players, and uh, not too many strategies, just finite set of strategies, you always have mixed Nash equilibrium. I, I will prove this. Uh, I will prove this uh, theorem because basically John Nash uh, obtained the Nobel Prize for it, so that would be uh, the, uh, harder to prove. And uh, okay, so uh, we can move to the next solution of the concept, and uh, we will introduce the game of traffic light. So. Imagine that players are drivers, driver 1 and driver 2, and each come at the crossroad, which is this. Okay. <laughs> so, there are two players. <laughs> One and two. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is this a <laughs> Well, number one is Englishman. Sorry? Number mm -hmm. one is Englishman. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 So suppose they know which uh, side, which, uh, which side of, of the road to drive on, and they come to the crossroad, and each can choose whether to cross or stop. So obviously, if I cross the road and the other loser would just stay there, then I would get a point, and he would get nothing. Other. If we both are losers, then we will just stay there and just wait there. So we will get nothing. But if we are brave enough to cross the road at the same time, then basically we will lose a lot of points because we would uh, both die in the <laughs> car <laughs> so we will lose, For instance, 100 points. So uh, this game shows that uh, there are uh, Nash equilibrium. For example, if the first player cross and the second player stop, and it's okay, right? But it is quite unfair for the second player, of course. Because he would get zero and the first one would cross. So we can introduce some probability. We can say that with some small epsilon, the second player would cross the road. And with one minus epsilon, he would stop. <coughs> Epsilon will be really, really small because it's epsilon. <laughs> <laughs> and the second player would have the same small epsilon and one minus epsilon. So there will be some probability and it would be the uh, mix actually equivalent. But the trouble is that uh, with the probability of epsilon squared, they both die. 
and that's suboptimal. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we need we would, we would like to introduce some uh, coordination device to prevent this situation, and I should I would define this uh, device as a semaphore. <laughs> and semaphore is a fair semaphore. So it shows green and red uh, with same probability. <laughs> so uh, basically, a semaphore or a correlation device would choose some strategy vector with some probability but it, it would avoid this crazy situation so that means that yeah that's what I want to say yes so an external correlation device suggests some situation, some strategy, with some probability. <coughs> what we want to do, it, it is just a device, it just gives advice. I, I can break the rules, but I want to have such conditions that uh, my expected payoff of choosing that situation will be optimal. That means that if I advise some strategies to behave, to cross the road only on the, uh, on the green line, then if I decide to cross the road on the red line, then I would not have an increase in the utility. So that's, that's also one solution concept, which is also possible. And we can see that. A correlated equilibrium is a generalization of mixed Nash equilibrium. Because in mixed Nash equilibrium, we don't have any device, so it's just a product of strategies. Okay, so enough of this. So, um, now we move to uh, the topic of how to find equilibria. And I will uh, show which complexity class is related to, to this problem and I will also show a special case of games which can be solved in polynomial time so the first uh, we'll introduce a PPAD complexity class which stands for polynomial parity argument directed case but first let's so show some examples problems so for example, cutting ham sandwiches, and you want to uh, cut a ham sandwich, so it basically means that you are given 10 sets of two end points, each in n dimensions, and you want to find a hyperplane, which for each of the n sets uh, leaves n points on each side. So it's just a practical example for the life. And the way is that again? Uh, the game, it's not a game, it's a problem. <coughs> I just wanted to show some problems in the AD. So if yeah. you would just have a look at other problems, for example, finding the Brower or Bursa on a fixed, fixed point, or uh, finding uh, equilibria in Marcus, they all are in PPAD complexity class. But the point of this slide is that it is far too complex for this introductory lecture to show what it is about so I just showed some examples and if you want some details you can see Bristol's <laughs> Papa Dimitri from 1994 so something more interesting so how is it related to finding Nash equilibrium is that uh, finding Nash equilibrium is PPAD complete so uh, for example as you have NP completeness you have PPAD completeness so the analogy is that every problem in PPAD can be uh, reduced to 
uh, finding Nash equilibrium. But the proof is uh, quite long, and the whole chapter 2 of this classical <coughs> great uh, basically Bible of algorithmic game theory called algorithmic game theory is <laughs> 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 devoted to this. So that's the end of proof. <laughs> now I promised a uh, polynomial time for solving games, and uh, this is uh, basically the special case of games which can be solved in polynomial times are two person zero sum games, which means that uh, if you well if you sum the payoff of the two players for any choice of strategy, then you would get zero. Or in human language, that means that uh, what one wins, the other player loses. So the nice example of two-person zero-sum games is uh, poker in two players. So what one wins, the other loses, right? And uh, we have a payoff matrix A, which is given for the role player, and obviously that's all we need because the payoff of the other would be minus a, right? And uh, suppose we are given Nash equilibrium. There, there is a strategy for the role player, a role vector p star, and strategy for column player, uh, column vector q star. And the ex expected payoff v star is denoted by this metric product. It is in this way because uh, there are some strategies in the first player, and some payoff metrics, and uh, strategies of the second player. And we need to just calculate the expected payoff in the matrix. So uh, the, the probability of choosing for example, the, the J element and the I element, it will be just the matrix product. I think it is obvious, so I don't want to talk about it more. So, what's next? Uh, the proposition is that uh, two person zero sum games can be solved by linear programming, which is uh, good quite a good method to solve it. So, let's move to the proof. So, the episode 1 of the proof. <coughs> Suppose you have Nash equilibrium. Even if others, even if you know the strategies of other players, you have no reason to deviate from your strategy. That was the definition <coughs> of Nash equilibrium. So with this information, we can see that if the role player's strategy P was already known, the code player would want to minimize his loss. Oh, this has no connection to this, but it's it's a nice observation. And uh, that is why uh, the cone player would choose the minimum of entries in P times A if, if P was already revealed. So the best publicly announced strategy for the role player would be to maximize this minimizing value. So maybe I will show the linear program in the next slide. This is uh, okay. First, we will show these two lines are talking about that P is a, a strategy for a role player, and the last line says that uh, B is the minimum of uh, that. P A row vector because oh sorry 
this way. Yeah. Because the cone prayer, uh, because it is a zero sum game, uh, the cone prayer would want to minimize this value because it's his cost. So this is the minimum of these elements, and uh, the Rockwell wants to maximize these minimums because that's that's uh, the value can guarantee to achieve. So if if we move, the role player can guarantee to win at least that value in any equilibrium, in any national equilibrium, uh, because it is is maximum of uh, the minimums. <laughs> So one inequality falls, and the other inequality yes, uh, that was the first observation in in the previous slide that uh, Nash equilibrium is optimal even if uh, my strategy is known to, to the opponent. So obviously uh, the the Nash, Nash equilibrium probability will be one solution to these uh, conditions. So we are when well, it's the optimum. So the, also the other inequality holds. So in the end, we can see that it is easy to see this uh, equality. I think in this group. Okay, so. Similarly, for the, we, have, we can have the linear program for the cone prior, and uh, that will be basically the same. It will be just the, to try to, trying to mi minimizing the maximums chosen by uh, the raw player, and we would have the with same argumentation. We will also have that uh, the V star of the initial program would be the same as this value. So therefore, uh, the uh, the Guarantee of rope player and cone player will be the same. And so, if we try to conclude this, uh, the optimal uh, probabilities of the first and second linear program are uh, form Nash equilibrium. This is just because the uh, the first player can guarantee to win at least the R, and he can win more than the R because the cone prior can guarantee to us at most VC. So these two are in uh, antagonistic relation. So they can't uh, win or uh, they can't gain more. So basically, that's why they form Nash equilibrium. And one, also one interesting fact is that the two programs are loose of each other. So thank you. So are there any questions? Uh, you talk about the PPID uh, class. Can you give us the definition of the class? Oh, uh, well, basically, uh, you are trying to uh, <coughs> to reduce the function <coughs> to a graph, to a diagraph. Uh, you have some diagraph, and the property of this graph is that uh, from every node, you have at most two arrows, one going down, one going in, at most, and you start at some sink. And your solution is at some also uh, at some source, and your solution it is at some sin. And uh, this graph can be exponentially large, mm -hmm. but you are uh, you are guaranteed that from if if you are given one vertex, then in point of time you can find your predecessor or your successor, right? But uh, because uh, the path from the sink to source can be exponentially large, it can take exponential times. 
time. Uh, so it is uh, it is always guaranteed there exists a solution. It is not NP, but there are some interesting relations uh, between PAD and uh, NP. It is. Uh, some of these can be equal, some of these can be different, nobody knows. But it is similar to graph isomorphism. Uh, it is one, interest, uh, one rare interesting problem that uh, nobody knows if it can be solved in point of time. Is it? If, if, if I may add, so there is one point that is what was uh, mentioning <coughs> that that this graph is given not uh, not like a list of vertices and edges, but uh, but it's rather generated online by a given Turing machine. So so this machine you will give. So so we say that the problem is in this in this class. If that because these problems are like find a solution of something. So if there exists a reduction to a Turing machine that generates on the fly the, this sort of graph and. Each time you enter some ID of a vertex, and it returns in a polynomial time the successor of this. So, so you can traverse this graph uh, in, in exponential time. But, but the representation of the graph is, is small. It's not exponential. Mm -hmm. It's given by a machine. Which is uh, sorry, of course, it is <coughs> polynomial. Any questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. The next poll will be in 10 minutes. 20 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 